become extremely worried about some grave new dangers to people that we're seeing in the world around us today. And I'm, of course, talking about climate change and the disasters that it brings. But I can personally guarantee you that level heads will always be able to turn lemons into lemonade. Uh, consider the Black Plague. This was an unspeakably rotten event, of course, in which one-third of Europe's population died in great agony. Uh, no one, of course, would wish such a thing on any civilization. Yet without it, without the Black Plague, the old business models of Europe would never have been overturned by the entrepreneurs of the Renaissance. And what would the world be without the Mona Lisa? Or closer to home, how about the Great Deluge? This uh, world-ending disaster, literally, was surely seen as a terrible catastrophe by Noah's contemporaries and perhaps by Noah himself. Yet Noah was ready to seize the day, and at the end of that day, not only was there a whole new world, but Noah found himself with a monopoly of the animals. Uh, for those of us in positions of responsibility, however, who might have to take charge in a crisis, even more innovative solutions are necessary. I'd like now to introduce my colleague here, Dr. Northrop Goody, who's the head of our emergency products development unit at Halliburton. And uh, Dr. Goody will be showing some mock-ups of some uh, items that his unit has developed. We want something that's going to be able to save a human being no matter what Mother Nature throws at him. And so this is the answer. This is the Halliburton Survival Ball. It's three easy steps for deployment, suiting up, inflating, and of course, launching. Launching out of a building, and we have an artist's rendition of what it might be like in Houston when we launch our survival balls. In the event of extreme catastrophe, there might be a scarcity of resources. In this case, we've got a survival ball here that's going up and extracting resources, um, in this case, from an animal. And you don't want to be exposed to the elements, but you still want to be able to extract resources from, for example, a cow. They're going to be able to go underwater, rated at 50 feet. They can be used in any condition. It doesn't matter whether you're in a landslide in California or even in the Arctic. Of course, any other conditions, whether tsunamis or um, tornadoes, the survival ball is designed to withstand. But the best part of the survival ball is that people need people. And so our biggest inspiration for the way that a community should work with survival balls comes from biology. Um, as some of you probably know, um, amoebas gather together and actually form another body. They aggregate. And so these one-celled organisms come together as a single body. For example, here's a raft formation of survival balls in the ocean, floating, communicating, exchanging nutrients, differentiating function. Last of all, this is literally thousands of survival balls uh, dancing through the streets. And um, we'll be happy to take any questions. So uh, if there are any uh, more technical ones for North or here or general ones. Yeah. Yep. I mean, in my mind, this clearly uh, also plays like the terrorist attacks. Uh, what kind of defense mechanisms do you envision against biological, chemical, radiological attacks? Uh, if you could demonstrate the turtle position, please, that would be great. Basically, if you duck down. I'll assume they'll have some kind of bubble mask or something. Yeah, at all. yeah. visor, yeah, yeah. heads-up display, the whole thing. Very cool. so. but to me, it was just the way it fit. It was yeah. probably if you're ever going to make them, some people like yeah. you want to wear them for a long time, you have more cushioning or something. Yeah. But I can imagine they'd be pretty darn expensive to make sure really market them. Well, yeah. yeah. They, they although are although, although yeah. I guess the people who want them will need them, most of the, you know, the price should be no object, right? I mean, if you're getting, per se, the well, that's right. cabinet yep. to pick a, you know. Hi. Northrop. Gary, how are you? It's very interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is modeling of terrorism around the world. So, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this is clearly, you know, something that plays right into that kind of an event. Well, it does. That's it. It's you know, much more so than 
you know, Katrina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean... We'd done all we could to show these people what sucked about letting greed run our future. Oh, dear. But instead of freaking out, they just took our business cards. Hello? Wonderful, and if you want to take one of mine here. Our effort had been a failure. It's not very well articulated, really. And come to think of it, all of our efforts have been failures. Yes man never gives up. We knew we could do it. All we needed was a whole new approach. Maybe making fun of stupid ideas was a stupid idea. We had to get smart because the people with the really stupid ideas were very, very smart. For Friedman and his followers, disaster was not just a chance to get rich, but an opportunity to push through all kinds of unpopular policies, like privatizing public schools, shutting down public hospitals, and kicking people out of their homes. This is the Lafitte housing project. It survived Katrina intact. That was lucky for the thousands of residents who wanted to come home and rebuild. So what did the government do? They decided to tear it down. The disaster for us started after the storm. Uh -huh. When people found out that you were gonna be marooned in a strange foreign city wanting to come home and the government was going to take your home away. This was ours before the storm. When storms happen everywhere else, people get a chance to go back home. This home to us. Why are they gonna take away our pride and joy? They don't know what people are going through. The whole city that sort of washed away. Now you gotta rebuild the whole thing. So part of what this was is if you ever had an idea that you couldn't get through before the storm, well, the storm meant that everything was, you know, tossed salad. So if this idea had been roundly rejected by the city and by voters and whatever, but now's your chance to sneak on in. When residents tried to come home after Katrina, they found themselves locked out by HUD, the U.S. government's Department of Housing and Urban Development. The federal government came up with a program to dismantle public housing. Uh, and privatize it and uh, that's what we're doing and so you've got to develop a nice community so that the poor have an opportunity to live in an environment where people work that they're part of the American dream and you'll get a number of folks that are that are not used to the type of lifestyle that we all live where trash is thrown on the ground or cursing off of the, the, the balcony. And the idea really is to provide role models essentially for, for poor folks, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. On the BBC, we tried to show that companies could behave differently and we learned that they couldn't until government made rules to control them. Yet even here in New Orleans, where help was most needed, government was also drinking the free market Kool-Aid. 